This is Reasons We Serve, a channel dedicated to the women and men in law enforcement. Episode 22, Jeff Bryan, retired special agent, Drug Enforcement Administration. Jeff began his career in 1991 in Salt Lake City, where he began working large-scale drug trafficking organizations that included heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, marijuana, and LSD distribution. During this time in Salt Lake City, methamphetamine laboratories were a major problem, and in order to combat the problem, Jeff, along with other DEA special agents in the office, became clandestine laboratory agents who specialized in the handling of hazardous chemicals and the dismantling of meth labs. In 1997, Jeff was transferred to the Sao Paulo, Brazil country office, where he worked closely with Brazilian law enforcement to target drug trafficking organizations in Brazil, as well as neighboring countries. Jeff was then transferred back to the Salt Lake City office in 2002, where he continued to work different type of drug cases, including a newly emerging ecstasy threat, as well as an opioid epidemic that he targeted until retiring in 2018. This is his story. Okay, can you introduce yourself for me? Yeah, my name is Jeff Bryan. Okay, and uh, Jeff, can you tell me a little bit about your uh, law enforcement career? Yeah, I started uh, I started with DEA in 1991. I uh, became a special agent in 91. Graduated from the DEA Academy there in Quantico, Virginia. I was initially assigned to the Salt Lake City Resident Office. At that time, it was a pretty small office. Um, and... I stayed here from 1991 until the end of 1997, just the beginning of, of 1998, at which time I then transferred to Sao Paulo, Brazil. I stayed there for four years, so I stayed there until 2002. And then at the end of 2002, I came back to Salt Lake City. I originally thought I was headed to Dallas. Um, but at the last minute, agent assignments called and said there was an opening in Salt Lake and wondered if I wanted to, to come back home. And so that was an obvious yes. So I, I was able to get back to Salt Lake City where I finished my career. So I stayed here from 2002 until 2018 when I retired. Okay. And can you, um, are you from the Salt Lake City area? Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. And so can you tell me a little bit about uh, growing up here in the Salt Lake area and was there anything growing up that drew you to law enforcement? How'd you get involved in law enforcement? Uh, you know, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if this really drew me to law enforcement, but when I was 16, I was working as a stock boy in a local discount store. Um, and, and I was, I was pretty big kid. I was pretty fast. I was on the football team and that kind of thing. I was athletic and, uh, and so during that time I, I worked there during high school. So I was 16, 17, and then I didn't work much my senior year. Um, but so I think I was a junior in high school. So I was probably 17 years old at the time. And I, I heard over the intercom that there, there was a code whenever there's a shoplifter. Right. And so I heard one of the cashiers up front, I was in the back of the store. And the the code, I don't even remember what it was, but they yelled out the code saying there was somebody running out the store with some stuff. And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen, you know? So, so I took off running and so he had a pretty good head start. Um, I ran up through the aisles and ran out and they said, he went that way. So I started chasing him and I ran him down. He, he went behind the, the stores. There was a, it was a, like a strip mall. He ran in front of all those and then ran behind and then he started hopping fences into a neighborhood. Well, I'm young and dumb and, and I don't even realize, you know, so, so I caught him and tackled him and was able to subdue him. And I dragged him back to the store. And by then the police were there. So they grabbed him and cuffed him and, and I got a hundred dollars for doing that from the store, you know? And then and then uh, I thought, well, that was kind of, that was kind of fun. It was really stupid. You know, I could have really been hurt. And, but when you're young, you don't think about that. Right. And so 
I did it twice more. Same thing as just a kid, you know? And, and I'm like, oh, and I, they gave me a hundred dollars every time I did, which is probably not the best thing to do either because then I was incentivized, you know? So anyway, long story that, that, that happened. And I kind of forgot about that. I went to college and I, I was in business and I wasn't loving it. I mean, I just, I was bored. I thought I'm an outdoors guy. I love to be in the outdoors. I love the Rocky mountains. I spend all of my free time there. And I thought, you know, can I really sit in an office all day and look at numbers and spreadsheets and all that stuff? And, and I just wasn't into it. And so I wasn't real happy. And I, I got married at that time and, and my wife said, well, find something else to do. You know, whatever, whatever you want to do, I'll support you. She's always been very supportive. So, so I, um, I took an elective class called constitutional law and it was just an elective. I was just, I needed credits. Right. And so I took this class and it really intrigued me. I was always a patriot. I loved the United States. My father served in the Navy at the end of world war II, and, and we were brought up to love our country and, and everything about it. And so uh, my siblings and I were, and so I was always, you know, a patriot and I always respected the country and, and what it stood for. And, and so I took this constitutional law class and I learned more about the constitution, you know, and through high school and junior high, you read the constitution, but you don't really grasp how important it really is and the guarantees that we have. But in college I kind of did. And so I really enjoyed it. And so I turned in some papers, I aced the class and the professor was a retired FBI guy and his name was Jack. And Jack called me to his office at the end of the semester. And I'm like, wow, well, what is this about? You know? And so I went in there, I was a little nervous and he said, Hey, um, I've, I've read your, your, your essays and everything you've turned in. You did great in the class and you really love your country. And would you ever consider serving your country? You know, would you ever thought about going into federal law enforcement? I'm like, I, I really hadn't, you know, and I thought maybe I should look into that. So that day I started looking into it. I'm like, this is for me. I want to do this. So, um, I started working toward that and I started researching some of the federal agencies and, and I kind of came across DEA and loved the mission. I loved the mission of DEA. They enforced title 21, which is the, the controlled substance act. And, um, I had friends growing up who, who, started making bad choices in junior high, started smoking weed and man, I saw their lives just luckily. I grew up in a home where my parents really, really cared and were vigilant in taking care of, of us and, and I never had a chance to do that kind of stuff, you know? And, and so I went a different direction than some of my friends in my neighborhood, you know, and, and, and some of their lives really went downhill. I mean, some have been in prison and, and they've just led really rough lives. But I saw that during that time, I already saw through high school and early college days, the, the effects of drugs and, and drug use. And so I loved the DEA mission, the whole idea of it. So that's kind of where I focused. And uh, so I graduated from college. I ended up uh, graduating from the university of Utah um, in, and I got a criminology certificate with my degree and, and then I applied with DEA and I was hired immediately. How old were you? So I was 25 at that time. And then by the time they did my background check and everything, I had just turned 26. Um, and so I got a call. I was, I was actually working construction and and that's when cell phones were just coming out. My, my son or my son, my boss had one of those big brick phones and he got a call on it and 
I could see him like going, we were laying, we were doing concrete or something and he was annoyed, you know, he's like, what, who, you know, and, and he said, this is for you. And I'm like, what? And so I said, hello. And they said, Hey, this is agent assignments or DEA or whatever. And, and you've been offered a position and here's when you need to report. Can you do that? I'm like, yeah, I'll be there. So I reported, um, in early 1991 to the Salt Lake City office, and then they sent me to the academy in Quantico. And can you explain a little bit about the academy? Because at this point, you've got no military, no law enforcement uh, experience, so you're just kind of getting thrown in oh, there yeah. at 25 years old. Yeah. Can you kind of just explain how the academy was for yeah. you? Yeah. So for me, um, I loved it. I, I was, uh, I loved every bit of it except for the, the cafeteria food. <laughs> right. But the training was unbelievable. Um, we spent most of our time in the classroom learning drug identification, learning about the drugs, what, how they affect people, what they look like, all that kind of stuff. We learned about the drugs themselves. We learned about uh, surveillance techniques. How do you follow people around without being seen? We learned about um, the law. We learned constitutional law. We learned uh, how to, how to do everything without, without violating people's constitutional rights. We learned how to stay safe on the job. Um, we learned raid tactics and we had practical exercises where we went out on the street and did fake surveillances with, um, at the time it was just the, the instructors, we would follow them around, you know, and they would try to, they would try to detect being followed and everything. So, um, and then we did a lot of uh, firearms training. Um, we did a lot of PT, physical physical training. We ran a ton. We did a million push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups. And so everyone was in good shape. And it was just, for me, I, I ate it up. Um, I loved it. And, and where was the academy at at the time? At, at Quantico. So yeah. we were co-located with the FBI in the same building. DEA now has their own training academy at Quantico, but it's a separate building. I think we still share the gym uh, and we still share the firearms ranges. But other than that, it's it's separate now. Just curious, do you have a, do you remember, did you have an impression of what the training was like for DEA versus say FBI at the time? Uh, I, I just remember that ours seemed a little more uh, strict. Um, I mean, we, we almost acted like military. I mean, we were walking down the hall saying, hello, sir. Good morning, sir. And that was just drilled into us. Um, anybody that we saw, we would always say good morning, good morning. And, and, uh, I, I don't know what their physical training was, was like. Um, but I know ours was very intense. Um, I remember. Okay. okay. And, and, and you had to have a certain you had to pass a certain level to be able to pass uh, in all of these things. So, so in the academy, we had the academic part in the classroom and we had several exams and you had to pass with an, I believe it was an 80% or better on all of the exams. Um, and they were, they were pretty intense. I mean, they were, it was like cramming two years of college into a four month period because it was all day, every day. And then uh, you had to pass the physical test. We had to pass the firearms test. And there were people who had gone through the whole thing and just couldn't pass either the physical or the firearms. Um, or some flunked out of the, the written exams. You know, they were very, the, the, the bar was pretty high. Um, which was cool because if you made it, you, you felt like you were elite. You know, that you, you did it. And everyone around you did it. And so there was a real feeling of camaraderie and, and team, yeah. you know, that you all went through it together and you made it, you know, and then after the academy, everybody just goes to their assignments. Because when we went to the academy, you show up and you're that we were there for, I don't know, two weeks or so. And then they came in and said, here's where you're headed. We signed a mobility agreement when we were hired saying, you're willing to go anywhere in the country. 
And so you went to the academy and then partway through the academy, you got your assignment. Now I remember calling my wife saying, initially I was sent to Las Cruces, New Mexico. I said, we're headed to Las Cruces, New Mexico. And somehow in between there, uh, I got sent to Salt Lake um, right at the very end. But until then, we thought we were headed to Las Cruces. And okay. so uh, it was It was a, what was your initial question about? about the academy oh just i just think the i got off on a tangent well you know, I, I was just curious if you had an opinion of oh. what the difference between dea oh, and yeah. FBI okay, yeah, I, training at the time so. i didn't know too much because i was so focused on i was very focused you know yeah I, I was the the ultimate student i i did really well in the academy i just loved it so i i excelled okay um, okay i mean as far as my scores and everything yeah like that yeah. i okay I so it. so at some point, they say you're going back to Salt Lake City, and you show up and you report in 1991 to Salt Lake City. Yeah. So how does your career begin, and what and what what are you doing? So, so we we all flew to our areas, and I arrive in Salt Lake City on a Saturday, I believe it was either Saturday or Friday, and I show up at the Salt Lake City office um, on a Monday morning. And it was just, it was a pretty small office. So there were only about five guys and they just, and, and I had met them all before cause I'd spent two weeks in the office before I got sent to the Academy. So I knew everybody. Um, and they said, Hey, we got a deal. We, we have a drug deal set up this afternoon. Here's your car, <laughs> you know, <laughs> here's, and, and, you know, when we are, whenever we go out on the street, there's always an ops plan. We always have a plan. And so, and we do a briefing. So we went into a little room and we did a briefing. We saw who the bad guys were, who we were buying drugs from. We saw who we think is going to deliver the drugs. We saw, you know, a map of where we thought they were going to go, where they were going to come from. So it's all planned out. And then we go out on the street to do this deal. And one of the agents was undercover. And he, um, they met in a parking lot. The bad guy showed up. The trunk went up, like five keys of, of cocaine in the trunk. And the agent gives the signal to make the bust. And we come in and two of them run. So there's a foot chase. So my first day on the job, I'm in a foot chase, tackle him, get him handcuffed. And, <laughs> and I'm like, this is, this is awesome. You know, I'm, I'm 26 years old and I'm chasing down bad guys literally in the street, you know? And so this is like, this is what I was born to do. I felt it, you know, I just, I loved it. And then, and then, uh, one guy got to a car and took off. So after we got them subdued, then it turns into a, a high speed chase. And back in those days you chased them, you know, and, Things have changed a lot since then. So we chase him down and we we're able to pin him down and, and he got out of his car and ran and we chased him down and got him. So in one day, I got in two foot chases and a high speed car chase. And I'm thinking, man, this is going to be so fun, <laughs> you know. But then uh, you go back to the office and then the paperwork starts and you document every single thing that happens. And and I learned early on, I had some great agents that were mentors. Um, I learned early on that if it's not on paper, it never happened. So if, if you want that evidence to be admitted into court, you have to document it and document it well and keep track of the custody of that evidence and exactly where everything was and who did what, who said what. And it became... I learned very quickly that if that doesn't happen later on down the road, when it goes to trial, it's very hard to prove what happened. But if everything is documented and all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, it's pretty easy to show that this is a bad guy. Here's the crime that was committed. He committed it. And then you give it over to the judge to sentence and, or the jury to, to find guilt or innocence. And then the judge to sentence. And, and so that was a, that was a really, uh, a learning period in my career of doing the, doing the paperwork. And I learned that for every hour on the street, 
it was about three hours at least of paperwork to do it right, you know. And so um, I felt like my paperwork was pretty solid. Um, the the U.S. attorneys that I worked with trusted me. Um, they they trusted my paperwork, and they knew that eventually, when I brought a case, it would be solid. There would be good evidence. Everything would be documented, and and I had a good relationship with them. So, so that first part of my career was very. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, I I didn't feel like because I didn't have law enforcement experience or military experience. I don't think it affected me much because I got everything I needed out of the academy because I bought it. I loved it and I learned it and then I was willing to learn after. Um, and to be honest in my 28 year career, I learned something every day to the very end. There was always something learned because the drug world is so dynamic and it changes so much. Their methods change. The drugs change. Uh, it's not a, you don't just learn it and you're done. There's always something to learn. Yeah. Yeah. So at that time, uh, is Salt Lake City what we consider a resident office? Yeah, it was a resident office, which means there was a resident agent in charge and there was a group supervisor. Okay. So, so those were the two bosses, a group supervisor and then the resident agent in charge was over the office. Okay. So you're in there, I think you said, with five other guys. So was there a typical case that you guys would work on? I mean, you're, you're obviously not in a bigger group yeah. where you have different groups specializing yeah. on stuff. Yeah. So was there a typical thing that you guys yeah. would work on? We did everything. So in big offices, there's a heroin group. There's a cocaine group. There's a meth lab group. We were the heroin group, the cocaine group, the meth lab group. And we did all the collateral duties like the evidence custodian and firearms instructors and all the collaterals that offices have. We also did those on top of trying to make cases. And in my opinion, that was valuable because I learned, um, I learned like our, our AO, our assistant, the office manager, um, she would call and say, Hey, can you come and help me do an audit? They had to audit the cash box because we had what's called impressed funds that we would use for, you know, to buy drugs, um, to, to purchase equipment, stuff like that. And so there was a cash box in a safe and there was uh, like a monthly audit that needed to be done. So I would go up and help with an audit. I would be a witness, one of two or three witnesses, and we would have to all count the money and then fill out the form and everything. And it's those kinds of things. And I was also assigned to be the drug and non-drug evidence custodian. So all the evidence that came in, I had to keep track of and, and file away and, and make sure that the custody of evidence was all taken care of. So those kinds of things the agents handled in these small offices. So I went on a, uh, in, in DEA, our cases move up. So we started a case in Salt Lake and I ended up going to New York where the source was. And it was some Colombians who were selling about 200 keys of cocaine. So we went back there to do a controlled delivery of the cocaine that we had seized. And we were delivering it to the people back there who, who would purchased it. And I saw three or four of my classmates back there. So I'd been on the job for maybe a year and a half. I had been undercover already. I had purchased cocaine, heroin, marijuana, meth, um, LSD. I'd purchased all those things. I was the drug and non-drug evidence custodian. I had done cash audits. I had, I mean, I had been traveled all over the place already on cases and I saw these guys, I'm like, hey, and we gave each other a big hug. And, and one of them was in a heroin group, had not left the office because he'd been on heroin wires um, his entire time. And, and, I, and I remember thinking, man, I don't know if I want to go to a big office because I have all this experience. I'm loving it. And he's hating it because he has to go to a, he's sitting at a computer all day listening to wires, listening to, to conversations. Uh, and he had, he goes, so 
how did you get here? I'm like, well, I did a 501, which is our travel authorization. And, you know, and he goes, I've never done that. He's never, he'd never booked evidence, let alone been in charge of the evidence. Um, he'd never gotten cash out from the impressed fund. We went through all these things. He's like, I can't believe you've done all these things in the first year and a half. And so for me, I was really grateful that I was able to go to a small office because everybody had told me initially, you got to go to a big office to get experience. And I, it, in my experience, it was the opposite. I was getting all the experience, every case in the office I was working because there were only five or six of us. And so if there was a case, they needed all of us to be there, you know, so we were all getting that kind of experience and, and loving it. We were all very close, very tight group. So can you talk a little bit about, you had mentioned this and maybe it's changed over the years, but at least when you started undercover, everybody did undercover. Right. Um, well, if you wanted to do undercover, yeah, yeah, right? You didn't have to. You, you didn't have to, but if, if you wanted to, you could do it. What was your... What was your feelings about undercover being 25 and you're, you're doing oh, this? Man. I loved doing undercover because you get, so when you go undercover, it's not like TV. You're not undercover for three weeks where you can't talk to your family and you're hanging out with the bad guys in the drug houses. That's not what undercover work is. That's Hollywood undercover. Undercover means you do a deal that day, you're the purchaser of the drugs, and you have an entire team of surveillance and guys around you. There's DEA has very specific rules on how we do deals and things like that, and I'm, I'm not going to go into those. Um, but the reason we have those rules is to keep us safe, to keep everybody safe, the public, the bad guy, and us. We don't want anything to go wrong. So we go to great lengths to make sure that it's not a rip. A rip means you're there to buy drugs. They don't really bring the drugs. They're there to rip your money. And so we have, we have a lot of fail safes to make sure that it's not a rip. Um, but the, I, I, another thing that I learned is when you go undercover, it's not about just buying the drugs. That's easy. You could train a monkey to go buy, give money and get something. The real art to undercover is getting the bad guys to talk, getting them to trust you and open up and talk about their prior deals, talk about who is involved, talk about where they're getting their drugs, talk about what they do with their money that they get their proceeds from drugs. Um, and so that to me was the most fun is getting a bad guy to sit in a car with me or in a, in a, a restaurant or somewhere where I have a recording device on me and they're telling me they're trying to get my confidence. They're trying to get my trust because you build on their ego and pretty soon they're saying, Oh no, I've been doing this for five years, five years. Dude, are you kidding me? I don't know what, how did you do that without getting caught? Well, I do this and this and this. And well, what in the heck do you, how do you get rid of your money? Because I'm finding that I have all this cash and I don't know how to get rid of this cash. Oh, you do this and this and this. And you just get them to open up and talk. And that, that was the most valuable part of being undercover is getting the evidence, not just meeting in a parking lot and doing a trade for drugs for money. It's the conversation around that deal. When it's all said and done, that person just sold you meth or heroin or cocaine or marijuana or whatever. And that's evidence in and of itself. But that recording of them talking about how long they've been doing it, all the people that are involved with them, the, the way that they get rid of their money, they launder their money, all those kinds of things are a goldmine of evidence. And that's what made it worth it to buy the drugs because it's expensive. It's a large part of part of our budget to purchase drugs. Um, but it makes it worth it when you get that kind of evidence because it's, you know, you go to trial and their voice is talking about how they've been a drug dealer for six years or 10 years or whatever. It's pretty hard to deny. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So 91 to 98, 97, 98, you're in Salt Lake city. 
and then you end up getting transferred to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yeah. Can you kind of explain how that whole thing goes? Yeah. So uh, during that 91 through 98 period, uh, that's when the small meth labs started to become really, really popular in Utah and the Midwest and California. So at first they were large labs. We were doing these huge labs with giant boiling flasks with triple neck flasks and they were giant meth lab operations where they were producing pounds and pounds at a time. Um, and, and those were, those were huge cases because when you took off a meth lab, you were taking out the source of the drugs. And, and so those were, those were really important. Then there was a guy in Utah up in Davis County who came up with a, a small meth lab recipe where, and, and he would charge people a certain amount of money to give them the recipe and teach them how to do it like a little tutorial. And it spread like wildfire because then people could make their own. They didn't have to buy from, from the dealers. They could make their own. And at that time it was pretty easy to get the chemicals you needed and the products you needed to make meth. Um, and there are several ways to make it, um, which we learned about in the Academy. And I went to a, a, a two week meth lab school back in Quantico after, after, uh, I was on for a while, we have a lot of in-service training during our career. And so, uh, I went to two lab schools, one lab school and one site safety officer school. Um, and it became, uh, those labs became so prevalent and popular that we were getting several a week and they were so manpower intensive because we had to, we had to put SCBAs on a uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, all the Tyvek suits and the boots and the gloves and, and to be able to dismantle these labs because the, the chemicals were so corrosive and dangerous and, and poison and the gases that they produced, they were just terribly uh, dangerous. Some of them would blow up and cause fires. And so, when they started this smaller process, now you're having people that that aren't really trained to do it, and they're just making small amounts at a time in a hotel room or the bathroom of their apartment. Uh, I remember once on Thanksgiving, I was the the night before Thanksgiving, I was with my partner, our wives together at his house, and we got our, back the, in that day. We had pagers; we didn't have cell phones, and our pagers both went off and we recognized the number and we knew we had a lab. So we call a number and the duty agent said, yeah, we got a lab that blew up in an apartment complex and it burned the apartment complex down. So we responded, cleaned up what we could of the glassware and then went on a hunt to, to find the guy. And we, we ended up finding him, but um, not until a week later. Um, but those kinds of things happened all the time. And it seemed like they happened always in the middle of the night. So we were out all night long. It seemed like they never happened during the day. But, and, and it would take, from the time you got there, it would take about 12 hours to clean it all up and gather all the evidence and then document the evidence and then get it disposed of properly. And it was costing a ton of money because we had to have a hazard waste company contracted with DEA to come and take the hazardous waste away. It was just a, a really tough time. And these, these meth labs were everywhere and they were, they were so dangerous. And then we just became kind of burned out on those meth labs. But I remember a couple of uh, meth labs in particular really made an impression on me. And one was a, was a guy who was a really bad guy. He'd been in prison for a long time. And as soon as he got out, he would start again and he would go back to prison as soon as he got out. So this is like his fourth time. And he was a dangerous guy. And, uh, one of our agents, a close friend of mine was undercover with him and was buying his meth. And we, through that purchase, we were able to follow him back to his lab. So now we knew where his lab was. So we got a search warrant for the lab. 
We hit it. It was in a house that he was renting. Um, we hit it, subdued him, went downstairs to where the lab was. And he was living there with a girl um, and and others. There, were, You know, these lab places, they... It's uh, it's hard to explain, but there are just people living there, men, women, children. Well, this particular one, we go downstairs. There's a lab, and there's a bed sheet hanging in an unfinished basement. The bed sheet is hanging across to divide this room. On the other seat of the bed, the other side of the bed sheet was the baby's crib. So the baby's crib was in the room with the lab, the bubbling glassware, creating the, the terrible, dangerous gases, and it's being sealed off by a bed sheet. You know? And I just remember thinking, man, these guys don't care about anything but the drug. And, and if, you, if you knew know anything about meth users, they don't. Meth users, it just consumes their life consumes their mind, causes psychosis, and that that's all they think about, care about, is getting meth. Then we go upstairs and open, you know, we do a search to find all the chemicals and everything. You know, it's a, you gather all the evidence you can. And so we look in the dishwasher, open the dishwasher, and there's glassware in there. There's beakers and flasks and everything in the dishwasher with the baby bottles and the baby nipples of the, for the bottles, you know, and I just remember what an impression to this day. I'm, I, I, I think about that and think, how could these people put that little child in that kind of harm's way, you know? And then, uh, there was another meth lab out in a place called West Point. It was in a trailer park, uh, a mobile home park and similar situation undercover led us to the lab. So we got a search warrant, hit the door, got the bad guys, and inside, and, and these meth labs, I could go into so much detail about the houses that they're in. So the meth lab was usually set up in one or two rooms, and then, you know, people lived in the house. But the house, we would sometimes put our respirators on to do the search of the rest of the house because of the smell of the house the grime on the floor, you couldn't, sometimes you could never tell what color it really was. If it was carpet, you had no idea what color it was or the linoleum or tile. It was just, you could scrape it off. There was just grime and dirt. The window seals had, the window seals had grime all around them and, you know, food everywhere, cereal bowls with the spoon stuck in and dried in so that you could pick up the cereal bowl with the spoon because it was dried in and all, you know, food and containers and Kentucky fried chicken. And it was just awful. They didn't care about anything but the drug. This particular meth lab, there were two children. One was a four year old boy and another one was just a little bit older. It should have been in school, but wasn't. And of course we get these children out as soon as we can take them outside and and try to comfort them and, you know, cause they're scared to death. And I remember like it was yesterday and this was in mid nineties, like it was yesterday, this little four year old boy. And I had a four year old boy. And so I knew the mentality of a four year old. He would hardly speak with anybody but me. Right. And the, my, my son, this little four-year-old was holding on to my leg and I'm in raid gear. I'm in black raid gear. By then I'd taken my helmet off and everything, but I'm still in raid gear and he's holding on to my leg and he's looking up at me and, and I'm, we're joking with him and trying to lighten it up and laughing and trying to get him to feel comfortable. And he literally looks up at me and asks me if he can go home with me. A four-year-old wants me to take his take him away from his parents. I couldn't believe it. I'm, I'm here. I am this you know DEA agent, and I'm fighting back the tears 
thinking about this four-year-old that's willing to go with a stranger dressed in black that just busted down his door. He was smart enough to know he needed to get out of that environment. He was hungry. So of course we call uh, DCFS, the family services, and and they come and, and help these kids and, and try to place them and get them in homes and everything. But it broke my heart. And those kinds of experiences happened all the time with meth. So, so you asked about why I went to Brazil. I had to get out. The, the meth labs were killing me. It was every night. We weren't sleeping. We were being exposed to chemicals. So uh, I spoke Portuguese already because um, I'd lived there earlier. And, and so an opening came open in Brazil and I was able to go down there for a couple of temporary duty services for 90 days at a time and kind of opened the door. And then when there became a vacancy in Brazil, I was able to get it. So, so at that point in my career, I went down to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and that was a whole different, like a whole different career. Yeah. And so there. how, how was with the EA overseas, yep. What, yep. what's your primary job and what did you end up doing in Brazil? So in Brazil, there was no meth. <laughs> of course, it was all cocaine. Um, the, Producing countries, Colombia and Bolivia, Purdue, uh, Peru, 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 those countries would use Brazil as transit, uh, as a transit country it's because Brazil at that time had 26 seaports on their east coast, large ports. And, and so the, the Colombians at the time that controlled the, the cocaine trade, they would, they would try to transport the cocaine into Brazil large, like hundreds of pounds at a time into Brazil and then get them to those seaports where they could go all over the world to Europe and, and the United States and other places. So my job there was to work with the Brazilian federal police for the most part and intercept these loads of cocaine that were coming across. And it was a ball. It, it was really fun. I made such good friends down there with the Brazilian police. They, they really cared. They really did. They wanted to do a good job and, and they welcomed our help for the most part. Um, we didn't try to tell them how to do their job. They were very capable, uh, but they sometimes lacked funding. Um, so we would sometimes fund their operations and help them. And, and of course we became close with certain factions of, you know, in certain towns and areas. So we worked with them a lot because we could trust them and, and we, we seized a lot of, of drugs uh, that, that was coming across. And so that was a, a great experience for me as an agent professionally, but it was awesome. I had four kids. They all end up speaking Portuguese. They still do to this day. My wife learned the language. She picked it up really well and she speaks. And so we have this, you know, we have this bond now in our, in our family where we, we went overseas and had this experience together. We traveled a lot and saw the country and they just, they absolutely loved Brazil. We love the Brazilian people. They're awesome. Um, and so, and my kids gained an appreciation for their own country too. They came home patriots and to this day get tears in their eyes when they hear the national anthem because they, they understand what a great country we have. Um, and so, that was a, a great experience to live down there. I'm, cu I'm curious about your um, experience, your opinion in terms of Brazil, because I'm talking to other people that serve uh, different times in different countries. Yeah. The Brazilians, what was their, at, at least at the time, uh, what was their attitude towards drugs in general? Um, similar to the Americans, uh, a lot of people use it. They, they were a consumer country as well. Uh, just like the United States. I mean, we bring a lot of the problem on ourselves because we, we try to treat everything with drugs, right? We forget things because we take drugs. We feel better because we take drugs and, and they were no different. There was a population that were the, the consumers, but the general feeling toward drugs was just the same here that, yeah, they're dangerous and we shouldn't use them. Uh, they had a lot of gangs that, that controlled the drug trade there in the favelas, in the slums. Um, and they were very violent, uh, just like the gangs are here. They kind of controlled things and, and set it up so that they controlled the things in those slums and, and protected each other and people protected them 
if they lived there because they needed their protection. So uh, it was very similar to here as far as the attitude toward drugs that they're dangerous and not good. But okay, yeah. okay. So you uh, you serve your time down there in Brazil, um, and you end up coming back to Salt Lake City. Yeah, I I got lucky. I thought I was headed to Dallas at the time. Um, they had some openings there, and and we had made some friends in Brazil that were from Dallas, some expats that were living down there working for a company, and so we uh, we thought, well, we'll go to Dallas, and we'll already have some friends there, and. And it'll be a change, a big office and stuff like that. So, um, and then at the last minute, I got a call from agent ass agent assignments, and they said, "Hey, there's uh, the ASAC." So, so during the time I was in Brazil, the Salt Lake City office became a district office. It was a resident office. It now became a district office. So now it had a, an assistant special agent in charge, and several groups. So it had a few group supervisors as well. So the, the office had grown uh, quite a bit uh, in the time I was gone. And um, and the ASAC there had heard, heard good things and, and said, hey, we want this guy to come back. So I was able to get back to Salt Lake, which was a miracle because uh, I had family here and my wife had family here. And so that was a no-brainer. We still owned our home. We didn't sell it when we went there. We rented it. So we were able to come back and, and get back into our home, which was which was really nice. We didn't have to buy a house. And so, uh, it worked out. I was able to get back to Salt Lake by then the meth lab problem had kind of mellowed out. Um, the meth was all being produced down in Mexico now. Um, just because of the, it was a, it's an opportunity for them to make money. And so very seldom did we get any labs after 2002. There were a few, um, but not like it was in the nineties. Okay. Uh, and the meth that was being produced in Mexico was really, really high quality. It was very pure stuff. So as, as a user, why make it when you can buy it? And it was plentiful and cheap and really high quality. And, and we had, the intelligent when we arrest people and we do interviews and everything, we get intelligence. And some of the intelligence told us that um, in Salt Lake, you don't the the meth that was coming up from the border wasn't cut as much as it is when it goes other places because they they had kind of a saying there that hey, when you send it to Salt Lake, you don't cut it because if you if they get cut meth, they won't buy it. They'll make their own. Because they anybody could make meth, so they just started sending good quality stuff here, and then it just kind of caught on, and and we were getting really high quality meth. I I purchased in, I think it was ninety or uh, two thousand. It was probably two thousand six or seven. I purchased uh, two pounds of meth from a, a guy. Um, that had been a dealer. And this was one of those cases where I took him to a steakhouse, he and his wife, and we talked for an hour and a half over dinner. And man, he just spilled his guts about all the drug deals that he'd done. Um, he actually talked about a couple of pipeline stops that were, that had cocaine stops on the, on the interstate that troopers had taken off that were his so we were able to attribute some of the some of that cocaine to him later and convict him of that. Um, and his son actually went to prison for one of those. He was driving the car, and he let his son take the fall for it. But uh, but anyway, I purchased two pounds from him. We put a tracker on his car. He went down to Mexico to get it. And anyway, long story short, he delivered the two pounds for me, and we sent it to our lab to be tested. And it was ninety nine percent pure so it was pharmaceutical grade methamphetamine mm. and and it was being sold on the streets now he was selling it to me he thought i lived in park city and and sold it to me knowing that i was gonna sell it you know but it was 99 percent pure it was pure meth it was huge shards of glass like this it was beautiful drug you know um but that's that was kind of the norm that if you sold meth in salt lake it had to be 
high quality. Otherwise, they'll make their own. So, and, and so when you got back, um, were you in the meth group or what? Or was So um, when I first got back, I was in a general enforcement group. So we did everything. We did all the drugs. Uh, and at that time, when I first got back in 2002, that's when ecstasy became really popular just right before that. So my first couple of cases when I got back were ecstasy cases or Molly or MDMA is what it is. And so, um, ecstasy became very popular. Um, it was being sold at these raves and they were really successful, these raves. So, and they were pulling the wool over people's eyes, parents' eyes. So they would have these, they would advertise these raves as big dance parties. Okay. And they were targeting pretty young kids, you know, young high school kids and young college age kids. That was their target group. And they would put these flyers up and they would send electronic flyers. Well, a kid comes home with a flyer and it says, no alcohol because at the raves, you don't sell alcohol. Do you know what you sell? Bottled water. So the parent, the kids come home and they say, look, this is just a dance party. It's just a bunch of kids. It's a party being sponsored by these promoters and they don't want any trouble. They just want to make money on the entrance fees and they sell bottled water is all they sell. You can't buy beer. You can't buy any other alcohol. It's just a, a nice, clean, fun dance party. That's how they were promoted, right? Well, the parents didn't know what ecstasy was. Ecstasy was promoted at these parties and at these raves, and ecstasy makes you extremely thirsty. And so they were charging like 10 bucks a bottle for a little bottle of Costco water, right? They were making a fortune selling water. The promoters knew what was going on, they didn't necessarily have to sell the drugs. They just provided the water and made 10 bucks a bottle. And the kids that were taking the Molly or the ecstasy, they were buying tons of bottles of water. So much so, some of them OD'd on water. They got too much water in their system. Their electrolytes flushed out. And so they had to be taken to the hospital because they were drinking so much water. Um, and so it kind of became a, a dangerous thing, but parents didn't know that this was happening because they were slated as these nice, clean, just dance parties, a great, a fun, clean, safe atmosphere for kids to go just dance. And really there was a, a dark underworld that was promoting these things. Yeah. And so that was what was happening during that time. And it was really hard to get the promoters. You couldn't prove that they knew what was going on. They kept their distance from the actual drugs. They allowed certain people to come in to sell it. But how do you prove that? You know, so that was kind of a, uh, we, we worked on that a lot. We bought a lot of ecstasy and, and uh, all the ecstasy was produced over in Europe, in the, in the Netherlands usually. And so we never were able to really get labs. It was just a, a drug of choice that, that kids were purchasing at the time that, was dangerous, but people didn't realize how dangerous it was. Um, similar to LSD kind of, you yeah. know, it's just really dangerous. Uh, and, and then, uh, but meth was still so, so popular here in Utah. Um, that most of my cases were meth cases, but they weren't lab cases anymore. They were just meth cases that were coming up from the border. Uh, and then, um, then in the mid teens, like 2016, 2017, then we really started to see a surge in opiates and pharmaceutical opiates. Uh, that's when the oxy eighties kind of hit the street. They, they were the drug of choice for a lot of opiate users. Um, it was 80 milligrams in one pill. 80 milligrams of oxycodone in one pill and, and they were called oxy eighties and they would initially, they could smoke those tablets and get all 80 milligrams. Then the, the company that produced them 
finally realized that that they were being abused like that. So they put some binders and buffers and other things in the tablets so they couldn't be smoked. It would destroy destroy the property of the drug if they were smoked. But they were still being really abused and and a lot of people were ODing on on pills. And sometimes the reason that there were so many people being uh, overdosing on these pills that a lot of just the general public doesn't understand. An opiate is an opiate. So whether it's oxycodone or heroin, it's the same drug. It's just a, a different chemical makeup of the drug and a different dose of the drug. And so a person that is taking oxycodone, legitimate pharmaceutical drug, knows exactly how much they're getting. There are five milligram tablets, there are 10 milligram tablets, 15, 20s, and 30s, and 80s. And so they knew what their drug tolerance was because an opiate user builds a tolerance to the drug. And so they knew, hey, I can safely take three pills or I can safely take five pills because my body has built up that immunity. Well, what happens when they run out of pills. They run out of pills and their they their dealer got busted or you know for whatever reason they don't they can't they don't have access to the pharmaceutical pill, the oxycodone. Then they can go get heroin on the street. Well, you never know what strength that heroin is. You don't know if it's been stepped on 10 times. Stepped on means cut. So you have an ounce of heroin you purchase for a certain amount and you want to make money selling that. Um, so you turn that into a bunch of eighth of grams or eight balls and you put other substances in with it to make it heavier. So when you sell it, you're making money, but you're selling less heroin and more other stuff that you've put in it. So when you get heroin on the street, you never know how many times that's been stepped on, how many times it's been cut. And, and so you just go off of the last time you took some heroin, you know, well, the last time you took the heroin, it might've been really weak. It might've been cut a lot. And so you had to take a lot. So now you're putting something in your arm or smoking something that is, has way more opiate in it than you knew. And so when you OD on heroin, you just go to sleep. You, your, your body just stops your heart stops beating, you stop breathing it because it's a, it's a depressant. It slows everything down your digestive system, um, your, your heart rate, your breathing, everything slows down. Well, when you OD on opiates, you slow down to a point where it just stops and that's how they die. They just suffocate. They don't breathe. And, and so, uh, a lot of people when they OD, they either took heroin or they tried to get clean and it's, it's tragic. They're constantly trying to get clean because it's no, it's not a fun life to be on drugs. And when you're, when you have that addiction, people that have never had that addiction, I don't think we can understand, but they'll do anything to get the drug. They'll literally do anything to get that drug, no matter how dangerous, no matter what kind of crime it is no matter who else they're hurting, it doesn't matter as long as they get that drug. So it's not a pleasant life to live and you have to have it and you have to have it two or three times a day sometimes, depending on your level of addiction and how much drug you have in your system. So, so these, uh, users are always trying to get clean. They'll go to rehab, they get arrested, they go to jail and get clean and they come back out and they've been clean for a few weeks or a couple months or however long it is. And then something happens. They meet up with old friends or whatever. They lose their job, whatever it is that triggers them to take that drug again. And they go back to taking the drug that they took before. Only now they don't have that same tolerance that their body had built up. So they take the two pills or the three pills or whatever, 
and it's more than their body can handle, so they OD. So that happens a lot. There, a lot of people that were clean, and their, their parents are so glad because they're finally clean, but then all of a sudden they OD. Okay, so Jeff, we were just in the middle of talking about how you were becoming tolerant from the opioids and moving to heroin. You could never talk to talk about uh, or you couldn't figure out what the purity level of the heroin was before we got interrupted by the lawnmower outside. So, um, so, so basically, at this point in your career, because uh, we talked a little bit before, are you in the TDS group at this point? No, that didn't start till about 2010. Okay. Okay. So, so you're working basically, is it safe to assume that you're working on pills and heroin cases at um, this point? Yes. Um, just because they were, uh, they were the new upcoming thing. Okay. Opioids were killing a lot of people. Um, the public outcry was about opioids. So we started targeting the, the dealers for opioids and, it was <clears throat> it wasn't just the heroin coming up from the border it was people getting scripts uh prescriptions from doctors um and that's a really really thin line because doctors are supposed to help people and when someone comes in and says they're in pain they want to help them and these people are very convincing and, you know, and they, they say they have back pain. It's pretty hard to diagnose. And the only thing that can help is an opioid, uh, an opiate. And so um, we had a lot of doctors get duped, you know, thinking they're helping them. And then we had, there are some doctors who make money off it. They're, quite frankly, they just started to turn into pill mills and they would, patients would line up. And they would spend two minutes with each patient. It would just be writing a script and collect the 75 to 150 bucks a piece, depending on what they charged for the office visit. And they were lined up out the door and just waiting their turn to see. I mean, we would do surveillance on some of these places and they literally had a line going out the door and, and we would time it. So from the time they went into the doctor's office, Till the time they came out and we would take the average of how many people went in and came out during that time. And some of them were a minute, some of them were two minutes, you know? Um, and that's how much time they were actually spending with the doctor. And so, uh, and just to be clear, Jeff, so that the doctor is making <clears throat> money because he's seeing a volume of patients and charging them insurance. Some of them charge insurance, but most of them start to turn to cash. It's just 120 bucks or 150 bucks for the office visit. So you have 50 people that you can see in the matter in a matter of an hour and a half times 150. That's pretty good money for not having to do anything. And so, in, and not all the doctors were doing this. There were just some rogue doctors that were doing this. And but it's really hard to prove that they're not providing care. So that became a, a really tough issue for us. And then there were uh, drug dealers who caught on to this. And they're like, okay, if I can go get a prescription, if I can go to a doctor and get a prescription and fake my elbow hurting or my knee or my back or something, and I can get them to, to prescribe me opiates, if I can get 10 other people to do that, and I provide the money for their script, I'll give them, I'll pay them for the office visit and I'll pay them to go get the drugs from the pharmacy and then I'll buy it from them. And then they sell it for a dollar a milligram on the street. They make a lot of money. So we had legitimate just drug dealers that were getting, they had a little army of people that were getting scripts and they were buying, they were putting money up front. They would pay the person to go to the doctor they would pay for the office visit and they would pay for the prescription at the pharmacy and then they would get that script or the, get the pills from the filled script and then they would sell it for a huge profit even though they had paid all that money up front. It was very lucrative. And so there were a lot of those um, and, and those were just like doing a regular uh, any drug case because at that point, 
they're just selling drugs. You know, it's once it comes out of the pharmacy and changes hands, that's just drug on the street. It's not a that's not a legitimate pharmaceutical prescription anymore. And and I'm curious for here in Salt Lake City, those guys that would you know go through all the process of grabbing somebody's scripts and selling them. Was Salt Lake City being used as a distribution hub to sell them to the rest of the country, or no? You just sell them right here on the street. Both. Um, we had some. Uh, we had some that were selling to places in Idaho and Wyoming, um, but it didn't go usually much further than that. But a lot of the a lot of the people here were going down to Las Vegas. There were some doctors down there that were the pill mill doctors. And so they would send their little army of people down there to get the pills. And then they would bring the pills back up here as well. So it was, it was a uh, kind of a combination of both, but most of the pills were sold locally here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so at what point, uh, at what point in your career do you end up going to the TDS group or the tactical so, diversion squad? So in 2010, uh, DEA created the tactical diversion squad. So this became such a problem throughout the country, Kentucky and, and Florida and, and in the West and the Midwest, it became such a problem that DEA said, we gotta, we've got to form some kind of a focused effort on these pills that are being sold because they're using they're using a system, a cl it's supposed to be a closed system. So the drugs are manufactured by, you know, like Purdue Pharma, for example, or the, the manufacturing companies of these drugs that are very effective drugs, right? They're manufactured, then they're sent to distributors who send them to the pharmacies and to the doctor's offices. Sometimes the doctor's offices have authorization to have some of these pills on hand. Um, and and then the doctor gives a prescription to a patient. They go to a pharmacy who has these pills and there's a, an inventory of them. And DEA diversion, the, the, the um, <laughs> what's that side of our house? The ed, not administrative. Uh, the diversion side of the house is the regulatory. So, okay. So diversion is a, is part of DEA that is the regulatory part of DEA. And they regulate that closed system of pills, of, of legitimate pharmaceutical drugs, from the manufacturer to the pharmacies, and then from the pharmacies to the, to the patients. That all is, it's an accounting system of all those pills. And so DEA realized that this closed system is being circumvented by diverting those pills from that closed system and it's going to people who are illegitimately getting those pills they're either faking being hurt um sometimes it's robberies pharmacy pharmacy robberies so they get the oxycodone from the robbery and then they sell it on the street so those pharmaceutical bills are no longer in that closed system and so DA recognized that and said, we've got to do something about this. So they created the tactical diversion squad, which means they're attacking the diversion of that closed system, the diversion of those pills from the closed system. And so then I became part of the diversion squad in, in 2010. Um, and so we focused on that. We focused on the pills that were being diverted from that closed system. And we largely just investigated those like any other drug crime. Um, there were somebody in charge that had minions who were doing the work and they were reaping the benefit basically is, is kind of what we discovered. And then we had a few rogue doctors here and there that were just making money, um, didn't care that the people were, I mean, we, we had undercovers go in sometimes and get pills and the, the conversation was, what do you want? You know, what, what do you want? The uh, oxy eighties. Okay. You know, they write the script out. It was, it was that blatant. Um, so uh, there was a lot of these places had no medical equipment in the office, no blood pressure cuff, no stethoscope, nothing to draw blood. It was just a, just an office with a copy machine and a cash box, you know, <laughs> and it wasn't a doctor's office at all. Um, and do you, um, 
So is that from 2010? Do you, do you retire out of yeah. the tactical diversion squad? I did. Then? I retired in 2018. Okay. Out of that squad. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So, kind of two final questions that I always like asking. Um, in terms of law enforcement career for you and how it affected your family, what's, what's your opinion on that? <laughs> Man, you probably ought to ask my kids. Uh, so I had two daughters and then two boys. And uh, it affected uh, our family life a little bit. Um, I remember distinctly one occasion, my daughter was a junior in high school. She was 5'8", beautiful girl, really pretty, um, very outgoing. Everyone loves her, just that kind of kid. Um, Smart, successful, um, good kid, made good choices. And I had been in a certain area of Salt Lake City that's a kind of a rougher area. Um, doing a case. We did a couple search warrants and takedowns and there was a lot of gang activity in this area. It was a real kind of a rough time for this area. And, and it had been a kind of a, one of those two day operations where it just never ends. You know, you're just arresting and doing search warrants and you don't sleep for 48 hours. And that was on a Thursday and Friday. I come home on a Friday night and she wants to go to a high school football game in that area. So her school was visiting that school and I know the area, there's no parking around there. So you have to park way away and then you have to walk to that, to that school. And, and she goes, yeah, my, she names her friends that she's going with. And I'm like, yeah, no, you, you're not, you're not going to go down there. You, you can't walk on that, on those streets right now, you know? And, and it was a bit of a blow up. Um, those kinds of things happen because of my perspective was different than theirs. Uh, but for the most part, my kids were pretty trusting and said, and I would explain to them, look, you just don't understand. Your dad just spent two solid days down there and it's really bad right now. It's rough. It's a dangerous place to be. And, and she goes, well, I'm going to be with my friends. It doesn't matter. You know, if you're with four other girls that are, that look just like you, um, and you're going to the football game, you know, it just, it wasn't going to happen. And so, you know, we had to sit down and I had to explain to her, Hey, I love you. And I, I, it's just too big of a risk right now. And, and so she didn't go, um, How about she wasn't what? happy about it, but th- those kinds of things happened a little bit. Uh, luckily my kids made pretty good choices. I shared with them a lot, not details, but I shared with them a lot about drug use and, and the consequences of drug use. So they were like completely anti-drug use. They still are to this day. They don't even drink alcohol. They won't because they see what it does to people. So, um, it was, it was, uh, it affected the way we raised our kids being in this career. But, uh, my wife kind of helped me keep a perspective and she was really good. She, a lot of law enforcement marriages go awry um, because you're out there in this world of, you see the most evil deal with the most evil people, um, evil things that happen to people. And, and then you come home and you're supposed to not internalize that. And you're not supposed to bring that home with you. It's hard. It's really hard. Uh, she was really good at balancing that. And she would say, Hey, take it easy. These are your kids, you know, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. So she was the saving grace there. She was really good at that. So in terms of your, your marriage there, so tell me why you think it was, I mean, obviously it has to do with her, but I know the amount of hours that you're putting in as a young DEA agent and, you know, even later on in your career. What made her tolerant of oh, that? Man. And and what, you know, what, why do you think she um, kind of held it all together? You know, I, I think it was just who she was. She's very strong, very independent. Um, she knew how much I loved the job and, and I was passionate about it. So she gave me a little pass there. But she was the kind, like we had concert tickets 
And up until an hour before I was going with her. And then the pager goes off or the phone goes off and we have a meth lab or something. And, you know, she's all ready to go. And I'm calling saying, not going to make it, you know. And instead of blowing up at me and blaming me, she, she realized it wasn't me. She would say, okay. And she would call her sister or mom or a friend and she would go anyway. You know, she, she didn't let it cramp her style. She was just independent enough to do it and didn't blame me. Didn't, didn't hold it against me. There were times it was pretty hard for, her, I'm sure. Um, but she, she was just a, that kind of person and still is. So it's a good life. Yeah. <laughs> I, I chose wisely. Let's put it that way. Okay. So last question for you from when you started in 1991, maybe even till today, can you think back and remember and see if there's been any change in your attitude of how you see people out in society um, until now? Oh, man. Yeah, that's a pretty broad question. Uh, well, obviously, the, the glaring obvious thing is the public perception of law enforcement right now. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. In my 28 years, uh, we never, I never saw someone's rights being violated. We'd report it. We, we weren't tolerant of that. We wouldn't do it. And everybody knew it. People were, um, it's not like TV. It's not Hollywood. Hollywood pisses me off because they cast this, you'll beat somebody up to get the answer. Or you, um, they invoke their rights and you force an answer out of them. That never ever happened. Nobody took a beating illegally, you know, that just took a beating. There were plenty of knockdown drag outs to subdue someone because they wouldn't comply. And you had to get control of them because it was either your life or theirs. They're, they say, F you, I'm not going to prison or I'm not going to jail tonight. Let's fight it out. And you don't just, come on, please. You know, you, you don't talk them into it. When they want to fight, they want to fight, and and you had to subdue them. But you never beat somebody up because they gave you a bad answer or wouldn't tell you the truth, or if they invoked their right to an attorney. That was it. That was it. That was the king's X right there. We're like, okay, you invoked your right. No more questions after that, right? And so, and then we never targeted. Uh, certain groups or individuals. We went where the evidence took us. When we made a buy, we followed the guy who made the delivery. We didn't know who he was or where he came from. It didn't matter to us. He was the source of supply. We didn't target certain individuals or groups. Never did that. We always followed the evidence. Um, and so it, it kills me today to see the bad rap that law enforcement gets because these uniformed officers, they are doing the hardest job on the planet. They're called in every time something bad happens, they're called to fix it. And sometimes when they are called to fix it, things go bad and they want to go home that night. They want to go see their family that night. They're not going to die because somebody was non-compliant and was able to pull a gun on them before they could pull theirs. It's, it's a tragic thing that's happening right now that people are non-compliant. I get it. Sometimes, like when we would go into a house, there would be people there that were not the drug dealers. Everybody got handcuffed initially for everybody's safety, right? But then after that, we say, okay, now who are you? Hey, I just came here to pick up my kid or whatever. And then we verify the story, cut them loose. It's over. But if that person wanted to fight at that moment when we came in the door, fight was on because there were lives at stake. And that's what the general public doesn't understand is people's lives are at stake when there's chaos. The police are just trying to get control of the situation and then we can sort it out. But when there's chaos, you have to elevate your level of aggression to get control of the situation. Just comply. If, if you're stopped for something that you didn't do, 
just comply. It'll they'll sort it out. You know, they'll sort it out. Don't fight with them. But we have this bad rap right now that police are targeting individuals or they're they're being abusive. I get it. There's probably some rogue guys out there. I never saw it in my career. I never saw that. But but I will I'll concede that there probably are. But they're dealt with. They're dealt with. But you can't paint with a broad stroke and flock shoot every cop because there's one bad one. They're trying to do a job. They're trying to protect neighborhoods and they're trying to protect the citizens of this country. They have a tough job to do. They get a call that there's a domestic dispute and the, and the husband has a gun and the, the woman is feeling threatened. Put yourself in that, in that cop's shoes. He has to respond to a door where behind that door, there's a guy who's already irritated. His, his, he's already elevated. And he has a weapon. As far as you know, he has a weapon because that's what the dispatcher told you. And you're supposed to go in there and fix it. He could, he could shoot through the door before he ever answered it. But you have to go knock on the door and defuse that situation. Most people could never handle that. But these cops do it time and time again, all day long, every single day. They see terrible traffic accidents where children are killed. And then they pull over a driver who's being reckless and has attitude with them. And they just came from an accident scene where a child just got killed. You don't think that cop has a right to to get after that guy for, for driving the way he did and cite him? You know, because they just came from an accident. These are the things that people don't realize that police officers see every day and experience every day. And then they have to take it home and and try to compartmentalize it. It's a tough thing to do. They deserve a lot more credit than the media is giving them. I'm disgusted with the media and I'm disgusted with police chiefs who won't stand up for their guys and the actions that they have to take at that time. I've been to plenty funerals of cops who were in a foot chase and no guns were drawn. They're chasing and the bad guy draws a gun and shoots over his shoulder and hits him square in the forehead. I've been to that funeral and I've seen the kids of that young officer and his wife distraught. And it's because somebody wouldn't comply. So then all the other officers that were at that funeral, they go to the next call and someone doesn't comply. And what is he thinking? That officer's thinking, well, my buddy, who's not with us anymore, got shot because somebody wouldn't comply. So I'm taking this guy down to the ground. He's going to get handcuffs on before he can hurt somebody. That's that's what's going through their mind. They want to go home at night. But that's not happening right now in our country. Somehow... Our, our citizens are convinced that the cops are the bad guys. They're just trying to do their job and they're trying to keep you safe. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's really hard to watch. Um, it's hard to see from the inside looking out because I know these guys and I know how hard they work and how much they care. They really do. Yeah. So it, it's hard. The other, the other thing that, that, that law enforcement deals with is you catch people in the act with guns, for example, we have gun laws. You are not allowed to commit a felon with a felony and be armed. That's a separate charge to be armed during the commission of a felony. That gun charge gets dropped every time. You know, there's when someone commits a crime, there's always several charges. And they usually plead to one or two. The gun count usually gets pled away. We have good gun laws on the books right now. We don't need to take our guns away from our citizens. You know, that's a constitutional right that shall not be infringed. Our citizens are good people for the most part. And and right now, there's this move that guns are evil. It's a few bad apples. It's some bad, evil people that are bad. And we have good laws. We just don't enforce them. We don't enforce it. Well, we try to enforce them. We sometimes get in trouble when we enforce them. But 
they're not adjudicated. They're not held accountable for breaking those laws. And so it just escalates and escalates and escalates until someone gets killed. You know, and that's what we're, we're seeing in our country right now. It's really, really sad. I, I hate to see it because I love my country, but the direction we're going is, is not healthy. Yeah. It's not good. Okay. Jeff, I really appreciate you chatting. Well, Niles, you are welcome. This has been Reasons We Serve, a channel dedicated to the women and men in law enforcement. Please like, share, subscribe, and leave comments. Reasons We Serve can be found on other audio platforms to include Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you would like to watch these interviews, they can be found on YouTube, Rumble, Vimeo, and Spotify.